Thank you, Ricky and worship team, for leading us this morning. A couple of quick things before I begin. First of all, I want to welcome our online community. So glad you can join us today from wherever you are uh, in the community or in the nation or in the world, but we're glad you're with us today. And secondly, <coughs> excuse me, I need to make a correction. A couple of weeks ago, we uh, informed you that we had exceeded our goal for the Advent Giving Serve the World project of $300,000. We actually, that we told you we raised $320,000, but that was a mistake. So I need to correct that for you today. When everything was finally tabulated um, and added up together, the actual amount was $420,000. So thank you very much for that. I was, tr I was trying to scare you a little bit, but something that worked. Well, two things about that. First of all, thank you. Uh, thank our entire church family for their ongoing extraordinary generosity. And secondly, let's continue. Uh, we believe God calls us to be a generous people. So let's ask him to grow us, grow our hearts as individuals and as a church family in generosity. Well, years ago, I came across the story of a Romanian pastor who loved cats. And I can forgive him for that misplaced affection. Uh, but one day, his cat climbed up in a small tree in front of his small apartment building uh, and got stuck. Too high up for him to reach, to rescue, so he got a bright idea. He took a small rope, reached up as high as he could, tied it onto the small tree, and tied the other end onto the bumper of his car, and then pulled it forward just enough to bend the sapling tree over so he could reach his cat. But when he went to reach for his cat, the rope snapped, and the tree snapped, and boing, shot the cat up into the air. I, like, I try not to smile when I get to this part of the story. And it happened so fast that he lost track of where the cat went. He couldn't see it, couldn't find it anywhere. So he looked around the apartment building, couldn't find it. So he knew, didn't know what else to do, so he just surrendered the whole matter to God. He prayed, Lord, I trust my cat to your will. Just a day or two later, he was in the grocery store locally, and he ran into a lady from his church who lived in the same apartment building and noticed in her cart she had a bag of cat food. He was surprised because he knew that she didn't like cats. So he asked her, how come you have a bag of cat food in your cart? She said, well, pastor, the strangest thing happened. She said, my nine-year-old daughter has been begging for a kitten for months now. I kept telling her, no, we don't need a cat. But she kept on and on. Finally, I said, fine. If God gives you a cat, you can keep it. <laughs> so she ran out of the balcony of our apartment building, and she began to pray, dear God, please give me a kitten that I can care for and love. Amen. And you won't believe what happened. This cat came flying out of the air, paused us, and landed right on our balcony, and it's been with us ever since. So I, I have, that's a fun story. I have no idea if that's true or not, uh, but it does raise some interesting questions about prayer. Uh, we're in our third week in the series we're calling Praying with Paul. And I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like over these last few weeks, Paul has been taking us to a kind of graduate school of prayer. His prayers just go beyond and, and deeper than what I typically hear myself praying about and for on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, not external things like you know, physical safety or health or safety when traveling or school or work or cats. Something deeper than that. Last week, we looked at Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, where he prays that his readers would know the glorious riches of God's grace. The power of the Holy Spirit, the vastness of Christ's love, that we would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. That's what he prayed, the graduate school of prayer. Now, today we look at another prayer, this time in the letter to the Colossians. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can look at Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we'll put the verses on the screen. But before I read, um, let me just mention that Colossae itself uh, was um, a small city uh, way to the east of Ephesus, about 100 miles to the east, uh, in what we call Turkey today. You see Ephesus there to the far west, Colossae nearby, and there are a couple other cities there as well. Uh, and Paul had never yet visited uh, this city. Uh, it was founded by a man named Epaphras, the church was, 
Uh, and he had become a believer in Christ through Paul's ministry in Ephesus and then kind of gone out to plant a church. And Paul's actually writing to his spiritual grandchildren. So we're going to take a look at uh, verses 9 through 14, what he prays for this church. Paul writes, for this reason, I have to ask what reason, uh, Paul has heard of this church. He's heard that their, that their faith is growing, that the church is growing, and he knows that wherever the gospel is growing, the church is going to face challenges. So he says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, the we there is Paul and likely Timothy, his young friend who had come to visit him in prison, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and, joy, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul lets the Colossians know that he is praying for them, and he lets them know what he is praying for them. And we're going to look at three things today, the request of this prayer, the purpose of the prayer, and then the result of the prayer. Uh, but before uh, we dive into that, um, I want to give you the background a little bit of Colossians. Why was Paul concerned? Paul had heard, evidently, from Epaphras, who was visiting him when he was in prison, that the Colossian church was facing uh, some challenges. And like all the early churches of that time, these young believers were surrounded by a pagan culture, which would, in, would have included uh, the cult of emperor worship. The early believers didn't participate in the worship of Caesar, and so they were seen as disloyal to the empire. They didn't practice the pagan rituals and festivals, so they were seen as suspect, uh, that they weren't uh, reliable, they weren't loyal citizens. But beyond that, there were some teachings happening, evidently, inside the church that were confusing some of these young followers of Jesus. These were teachings that had to do either with a, a kind of Jewish legalism, you have to follow this law or that law or the food laws or circumcision in order to be a real follower of Jesus, or they were coming out of Greek philosophy. Now, Greek philosophy at the time um, pointed to sort of a, a special knowledge that Jesus wasn't enough, uh, that they taught, among other things, that the spiritual world was good, the physical world was evil, therefore Jesus couldn't have had a real body, so you needed more. You needed a special knowledge uh, that was achieved through mystical and ascetic religious experiences, and all this was slightly confusing to the young believers. And it's not that unlike we face today in our culture, what I would call the current cultural narrative of the gospel of the self. Live your own truth, speak your own truth, be true to your heart, live your best life now. Or those who say all religions lead to God so long as you're sincere. Uh, what matters is that what you believe makes you a better version of you and helps you feel better about yourself. Or you could add to that the gospel of science or the gospel of wealth or the gospel of politics, anything but the gospel of Jesus. So Paul writes to them, and here's the request he makes. The first point is the request. What requ request does Paul want for these early believers? Well, years ago, I, found, I had a friend um, who developed kind of a unique dating strategy. He was a student at a small Christian college campus, and so when he became interested in, in a young lady, he would uh, strike up a conversation, and at just the right time, he would say something like, well, you know, I've been, I've been praying about this a lot, and I really feel prompted that I should ask you out. I think it's God's will that you go out with me. I'm not kidding. He used it, and it worked for a time until he tried it with one particular young lady who looked right back at him and said, well, you need to know that I pray too. She said, and God told me that you're a jerk. Uh, now, my friend was making the very common mistake of, of mistaking his own will for God's will. Uh, kind of like the guy on a diet who has to drive by uh, his favorite bakery with his favorite donut on his way to work. So he prays, Lord, if it's your will that I have a donut, please cause a parking space to open up right in front of the bakery. And after eight times around the block, <laughs> that one might be a little personal. 
Paul writes, we continue to ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. His request is for the knowledge of God's will. Now, when we think of that phrase, God's will or, or the will of God, we think of things like, you know, what school should I go to? What house should I buy? Who should I marry? Uh, should I take this job or that job? But Paul's pressing a little deeper than that. Of course, it's okay for us to pray for daily decisions, dating or donuts, or about big decisions, because the Holy Spirit can and does give us guidance and promptings. Other people can give us wisdom. It's okay to pray for those things. But Paul's pressing deeper here. He's talking about that which God wants for all of us all the time. Now, there's something we can miss in Paul's language here if we just see it in English. The usual word for knowledge in the ancient Greek language was gnosis. And here Paul uses the word epigenosis, uh, which means more than just knowing something. It's an intensified form of the word. It means full discernment, wisdom. And some scholars think Paul chooses this word in contrast to gnosis, which was the word that the Greek philosophers used for knowledge, that he's pressing to something deeper. He's saying that the will of God is something that isn't mysterious, it doesn't require some sort of special knowledge, but has already been fully revealed to us in Christ. We see this just a chapter later in Colossians chapter 2, when Paul writes, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea, that was a local city, and for all who have not met yet met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures and wisdom of knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. In other words, Paul knows they're being exposed to all kinds of high-sounding philosophical ideas. But he prays for full and complete knowledge of Christ and that knowing him will help align our hearts and our lives with God's will. So how do we know? What do we know about God's will for all of us all the time? Let's take a quick little tour of other places in Paul's writings in the New Testament where we can learn. In Romans chapter 12, Paul writes, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here Paul's just saying that God's will runs contrary to the wisdom and patterns of this world, of our culture around us. In 1 Timothy, we read, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. It's God's will, his desire, that all people everywhere come to faith in Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul writes, rejoice always, Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's God's will that we all rejoice and pray and give thanks. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he writes, it's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should, have, should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. He says it's God's will that we be sanctified. That's a fancy word. It just means that we be made pure and holy, that our lives are different from the world around us. And finally, Peter writes in 1 Peter, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor or the, as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So it's God's will that we do good in the communities and bless the communities in which we live. Now, here in this teaching, in Colossians, he's teaching, Paul is teaching that we learn and understand the will of God through the Holy Spirit. He says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. What I want to point out here is the intersection between God's will, God's word, 
and the Holy Spirit. We saw last week that Paul was teaching that the Holy Spirit brings, is guaranteed to us when we become believers in Jesus and fills us with power. Here he's teaching that the power of the Holy Spirit guides us into wisdom and understanding. And that's what Jesus told us would happen in John chapter 16 when he promises the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says it this way, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit taught words. And this is why, by the way, when we gather every Sunday in all our campuses and all our worship services, we teach from God's Word. Because we believe that Jesus taught us that the Spirit of God that dwells in us will teach us and enlighten us with understanding of His will as we read and study His Word. So Paul's request is that these believers know God's will through the guidance of His Word and his spirit. Secondly, we see the purpose of this prayer. The purposes of this prayer. Now, I've mentioned before that I worked my way through grad school partly by coaching some basketball um, at Taylor University in Indiana. Uh, at the time, my brother was actually was on the team for a portion of the time while I was uh, coaching there. And the coach at the time was um, uh, a stickler for discipline. Hall of Fame coach, old school, but discipline was his thing. And part of the, one of the ways he emphasized that was by how he demanded that the players dress for home games. So even though they were just walking from their dorms to the gym, he wanted them to wear dress pants, shirts, and ties uh, to the game because he wanted them to represent the university and the team with class and respect. Well, it was around Christmas break. I think it was my uh, brother's senior year at school. So my parents had driven from Florida, central Florida, all the way to central Indiana for the chance to watch him play. And it was their only chance to watch him play in person that year. There were no video, no video and all then at that, that time. They came in person to watch him play. But for some reason, my brother um, was running late or, or didn't get his laundry done, but he wore jeans to the game, jeans, a shirt, and tie. He walked into the gym. The coach took one look and said, I said, no jeans, and promptly benched him for the whole first half of the game as discipline. My parents came all the way, 1,000 miles, and they, the coach benched him for not wearing dress pants. My mom was so mad. She was mad for years after that. Uh, you could say that the coach didn't think my brother dressed in a worthy manner. Paul says in verse 10 here, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. So Paul prays for the knowledge of God's will so that they would live a life worthy of the Lord. Paul's words literally are to walk worthily of the Lord. Now, when we first hear this, it's an overwhelming requirement. It sounds like an impossibly high standard. Like, how can we possibly be worthy of Jesus? But we need to see here that Paul is not giving us another set of religious rules to live by, you know, wear dress shirts and dress pants and a tie to church. He's not demanding a new kind of legalism because that's not the gospel. The gospel is not a set of religious rules that we have to keep in order to please God. The gospel is a relationship defined by grace and love. I think Paul's teaching the opposite of legalism. Remember what he's already prayed, that we be filled with the knowledge of God by the Holy Spirit. Last week in Ephesians, he reminded us that God has poured out his glorious riches his grace into us, that we've, he's filled us with the vastness of Christ's love for us, the very fullness of God, that we've been chosen, adopted, redeemed. And now Paul just says, so walk that way. So live out that new identity. I was trying to think of ways to illustrate this, and I thought about marriage. When I got married, my status changed. When you got married, your status changed, not just legally, 
not just for tax purposes, but it changed dramatically relationally. I was no longer a single guy concerned for myself. I was now a husband, now concerned about the, and responsible for the well-being of my wife. My status changed, my priorities changed, my behavior changed, not as a set of rules to live by, but because of a covenant love relationship. Or when I became a parent, my status changed again. No longer a husband, now a husband and a father, and my priorities and my behavior changed. Not by a set of rules, but by a love relationship. I think that's what Paul's saying here. When we come to faith in Jesus, our status changes. We have a new identity. We have a new operating system that he calls the power of the Holy Spirit. We have a new purpose and an eternal destiny. So therefore, we walk, we live in a different way. We walk worthy of Jesus. Now, this means that their lives, the Colossians' lives, would be set apart from the surrounding culture. It means they would live qualitatively different lives. We see a hint of what the surrounding culture was like a uh, chapter or two later in Colossians 3, we read, Paul says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. And Paul is saying here, having been chosen, having been adopted, having been filled with the knowledge and love of Christ, they are to simply walk in a new way which means, Paul says, bearing fruit in every good work. Now, what does that mean? What does he mean by fruit? I think he means at least three things here. First, I think he's talking about the fruit of godly character. The fruit of character. Peter talks about it this way in 2 Peter 1. His divine power, there's power, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him. There's knowledge who called us by his own glory and goodness. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and the goodness knowledge and the knowledge self-control and the self-control perseverance and the perseverance godliness and the godliness mutual affection and the mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is saying the knowledge of God our identity in Christ produces the fruit of godly character in our lives. Secondly, I think he's talking about the fruit of service. In Ephesians 2, Paul writes, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's saying here we can do nothing to earn or deserve our salvation. That's grace lavished upon us. But when we experience that grace, grace then expresses itself through service. Serving our church family, serving our community, and serving the world. Thirdly, I think he's talking about the fruit of influence. Influence. In Philippians 2, he writes... Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. The fruit of influence, like light in a dark place, maybe in your family, maybe in your place of work, maybe in your community, influence. So what's God's purpose for your life? What's God's will? What fruit does he want to produce? Godly character, faithful service, and spiritual influence. And all that leads us to the third thing I see in this prayer, and that is the result. What's the result Paul is hoping for, praying for? Some 30 plus years ago, um, my brother Joe and I decided to, for some reason, that we wanted to compete in a triathlon. Not the full, not the full Ironman that some of you have done. I know Bruce has done one of those. 
Bruce is a whole other category, but we wanted to do a mini triathlon. It involved like a three-quarter mile swim, 18-mile bike ride, and a 6.2-mile run. So it's still pretty challenging. So we trained for like six months, got into the best shape I'd been in since my college days. Day of the race comes, and there's a swim stage first. Dive into cold lake water and hyperventilated, couldn't breathe, dog paddled, got swam over by like a thousand swimmers. It's such a violent thing. Uh, a boat came up next to me trying to rescue me like five minutes into the race. You had enough? I know this is the way out. I just swim like this. This is the way. <laughs> Managed to straggle out of the water, and I still hate swimming to this day. Then came the bike part of the, the race, and biking was great. We, we, it was easier. You know, swimming is the only thing that if you stop doing it, you die. <laughs> you stop biking, you, you don't die. You just kind of fall over. But. So he bikes, and, and over the next 45 minutes of ordering a bike, we just, passed, we just passed biker after biker. We were fast. We were just going. And then comes the run, and that was even better. We hit our stride. We, you know, we, we passing dozens of runners, just feeling great, just, just flying along, you know. Then about a mile from the end of the race, we're two hours in now, about a mile from the end, I hear the sound behind me, and it's, a, it's an awful sound. It's kind of a rasping, wheezing, scraping sound. <laughs> and I realized it's a runner, it's somebody behind me. And I immediately thought, man, that, that person's in bad shape. I'm so glad that we trained and I'm, I'm in such good shape and doing so much better than whoever that is back there. And then I realized the sound was getting closer. It was the sound, that whoever that was was catching up. <laughs> it kept getting closer. And then this lady had to be a 50-year-old, 55-year-old woman. We were in our early 30s. She catches up to us. She's running right next to us, and she's passing us. She's got an awkward, she's wearing like half a wetsuit still from the swim. That was like two hours ago. And she's dragging one foot, <laughs> and she's passing us. And it dawned on me that for two hours, this woman was catching up to us. It was utterly humiliating and profoundly inspiring at the same time. Paul says here, verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Now, we saw the last week that when Paul talks about power and might, the power and might of God, he's talking about the power that can raise from the dead, the power of the resurrection. And here he says he gives us this power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, to give us great endurance and patience. I think if you're paying attention, there should be a little bit of a surprise here. Maybe even a little bit of disappointment. I mean, he might have said, I'm giving you the power, my might, my strength, so that you can see miracles in your life, so that you can be healed from every disease, be delivered from every danger. But he doesn't say that. He says, to give you my power so that you can have great endurance and patience. Here's the thing. We only need great endurance and patience if the race is long and hard. Right? He knew the Colossians were facing then and would face challenges, trials, and pain. And Paul knows this because he's already experienced challenges, trials, and pain. He's in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to ever get out. So my question is, how about, how about us? You know, what challenges do we face today as a church family? How about you? How is faith a challenge for you today? Where do you need endurance? Someone you love dealing with a sickness? Something else going on? inside you that no one else really knows about, but it's hard. Paul prays that we would know the power of God dwelling in us that gives us endurance and patience. And then he closes this prayer, verse 12, and giving joyful thanks, I wrote, him, I wrote down, big question mark, what? He's just talked about endurance and patience, 
and we are to give joyful thanks. But he tells us why. To the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He's just reminding them of their status in Christ. He says, You have, don't, he says, don't forget, you have been qualified for an inheritance. That is forever. You ha- are no longer in the dark. You have been rescued. You're now citizens of the kingdom of light. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven. So whatever else you're facing that might be a challenge, whatever is going on, never forget who you are, your status in Christ, and give joyful thanks. Way back in 1979, I lived for 10, 11 months or so in Geneva, Switzerland. I was playing and coaching basketball for a small Swiss club team. Uh, While I was there, I attended this little English-speaking Baptist church in the heart of the old city. And the congregation was made up of all English speakers, but they were from all over the world. I think there were only two of us that were uh, from the States. One Sunday morning, I remember the pastor, who was British, read a letter he had received from a pastor, a friend of his, who was a pastor in Poland. At the time, Poland was going through an upheaval a uh, crumbling communist regime was uh, creating all sorts of chaos in, in, in the nation. And this little Polish church had twice had their building bulldozed to the ground by the local communist authorities just to try to destroy their ministry altogether. And each time, this little group of Polish believers had found a way to rebuild their little church building. And as he read this letter, I was thinking to myself, well, how hard it must be how hard that must be to be a Christian in that part of the world. And then the letter ended with this. This pastor wrote, please tell any American Christians in your congregation, I knew I was one of the two, that we in Poland are praying for them because we have heard how hard it is to be a Christian in America. I never forgot that prayer. Now, we don't experience a kind of persecution that bulldozes our church buildings down on a whim. We don't. But we do live in a culture that increasingly is telling us that what we believe and what we celebrate every Sunday is foolishness. We live in a culture that's telling our children that what we're teaching them is foolishness. So Paul here prays for these ancient Colossian believers who are facing similar kinds of challenges. And he also prays for us. And he prays for you. So this week, the invitation is the same as last week. That is, I want you to bookmark this prayer in your Bible. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And make it your prayer. The first time you read through it, allow it to be prayed for you. This is Paul's prayer through God's word for you. So pray it that way. But next, I want you to pray it again, this time for someone in your life. If you have children, pray it for them. Maybe let them know you're praying this prayer for them. If someone in your family is at a university somewhere, pray this prayer for them, that they would know God's will that they would bear fruit and walk in a manner worthy and that they would hang on and endure and have great patience. May we go to the graduate school of prayer with Paul. Will you bow with me as we close? Lord, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for the gift and the invitation that is prayer. And for this prayer that reaches down through the centuries by the power of your word and your spirit to encourage and strengthen us where we are. So, thank you and teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ricky and worship team. Just before the benediction, if you came here prepared to give in person today, our generosity boxes are in the back of the lobby. Thank you so much for your generosity. And if you would like to spend a few moments in prayer with a member of our prayer team, our glass room is open for that purpose, just out in the lobby, and they would be happy to spend time with you. Now receive the benediction that comes from Hebrews chapter 13. 
Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.